and uh, back to the Vineski thing, and we'll just take off from there. Um, what I was saying is, is that uh, in the argument with, not argument, but the workout, the mm -hmm. exercise with Vineski, what, what becomes clear, and it's the same thing with Reed Lyon, is that most people look at this with what you might consider a, an adultopomorphic, <laughs> yeah. right? They're looking at this as an adult, as somebody who knows how to do it. It's automatic for them. Exactly. They're yeah. looking at it through the lenses of computer science and pattern yeah. analysis yeah. and all this other abstract reasoning skills made possible by this thing called the alphabet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then coming up with patterns to describe it all from being from an on the adult other side perspective. Of it. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. an entirely different yeah. thing yeah. than being underneath it, trying yeah. to come through it, which right. is the challenge the children are facing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Great. We rolling? Rolling. Good. Okay. Well, it's really a pleasure and delight to have a chance to talk with you. Delighted to be here. You know, as we, we get a lot of email from people, uh, and uh, one of the things that comes up is that, you know, there's, there's a, probably one of the f most fiercely loyal and passionate groups out there in the world is, the, is a group of parents who are advocates for their children. And those parents that are advocates for children that have various degrees of learning disabilities or difficulties know your name. Mm -hmm. oh, thank <laughs> yeah. you. Thanks. And thanks. you're a hero in that community. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a delight to have an opportunity to talk with you. Yeah. Well, the, the bias that I bring to the, to the table here is that um, adults who enjoy reading, most of us do, reading is a pleasurable experience. It's something that brings us comfort. It's very difficult for us to relate to a child who struggles so much with that process. And what I found a number of years ago, I realized in my career that there's a great irony in education. And that is that most of us who teach school did well when we were in school and enjoyed going to school. Why would you become a teacher if you didn't like school? And uh, most of us are carrying degrees and advanced degrees, so we did pretty well there. So the great irony is that the child to whom we can best relate is a child who needs us the least. The captain of the football team, the head of the debating club, the, the, the head cheerleader, and the child who needs us the most is the kid we can least relate to. And it kind of put me on a mission of explaining to adults how painful it is to be a child who's unable to conquer the reading process. Um, I've been on the road doing this for several decades now, and uh, I've heard some amazing stories from people. There was one young man, I was speaking at a community college on Cape Cod, and uh, this young man approached me and um, asked if we, could, if we could talk. And he made an appointment to meet me in my office a little bit later. And um, he sat down and he said, explained to me that he was a, an adult at the community college with a severe learning disability. And uh, he said now he's been recently diagnosed. Uh, no one knew what the problem was in high school. It took five years to get through high school. Um, and now that the problem was diagnosed, he got into college and the problem was diagnosed there and he realizes that he had severe dyslexia. Um, and he said what he wanted to do was to go out on the road and to speak to other people, parents and teachers, about what it's like to be a child who struggles with reading and learning. So I was counseling him about how to get a speaking career started. And one of the pieces of advice I gave him is that people love stories. People, just all the great teachers from Jesus to Mao have used stories to teach. And um, I said, do you have any stories you could share about what it's like to be a child who's an undiagnosed, has an undiagnosed reading problem? And he thought for a little while and he said, well, maybe the ear story. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, the value of story. Yeah. Okay. 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 One of the things that I came to realize very early in my career is there's a tremendous irony in education, and that is this. Um, if you sit on this side of the desk as a teacher, the chances are you had minimal problems when you were sitting on the other side of the desk as a student. Um, most teachers liked going to school. Why would you become a teacher if you didn't like school? And most teachers did well in school. And so the great irony is the child to whom we can best relate is a child who is most like us, the captain of the football team, the head of the debating club. And the child that we can't relate to is a child who ironically needs us the most, the child who struggles in school. So it sort of put me in a road of trying to convince adults how deep this struggle runs for kids who struggle with reading and language. I've heard some amazing stories from people. I was speaking not too long ago at a community college in Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And this young man approached me and said, I really want to talk to you about something. Can I set up an appointment? He set up an appointment, came to see me a week later. And he said, um, he said my name is Daniel. Uh, I'm a student here at the community college. 
He said, I uh, have severe learning problems. He said, I had a horrible time in elementary school, middle school, and high school. It took me five years to get through high school. Finally graduated from high school. Uh, under the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, if you graduate from high school, you can automatically go to community college. So he was accepted at the community college. And he said, fortunately, one of his first semesters at the college, one of the professors recognized the symptoms. He went for some testing. Turns out he had severe learning disabilities. And uh, uh, he now is getting a little bit of tutoring, a little bit of help, and he's doing quite well. He said, but I'm also a real good public speaker, and I want to do what you do. I want to go around the country and speak about what it's like to be an undiagnosed child with a learning problem. And um, so I was giving him some advice as to how to break into this, uh, the speaking business. And I said, one of the things I found, Daniel, is that people love stories. Uh, all the great teachers use stories to, to get a point across. And I said, do you have any stories you could share? And he said, well, maybe the, the ear story, I could share the ear story. And I said, well, share that story with me. And he wanted to tell me his story. He, he said, I was born here in Cape Cod and my dad was a lobster fisherman. He said his job was to catch lobsters and he was very good at it and he worked very hard at it. He was the first guy down on his boats in the morning and the last one to bring his traps in at night. Um, he was uh, a very, very hardworking guy who took his job very seriously. My mom was a housewife. It was her job to have the house nice and clean and have dinner on the table when dad got home from work. And uh, she took her job seriously and did real well at her job. And it was made very clear to us as the kids in the family that it was our job to do well in school. There would be no excuses. Everyone had their job to do. We were all to do well in school. And that was the, the, those were the jobs that were defined. He said, and I got into first grade and I couldn't read. He put it beautifully. He said, almost poetically, he said, I, the other kids could make the books talk. They'd pick the books up and words would come out. He said, to me, it just looked like lines and circles and squiggles. I had no idea where the words were. He said, and I realized some 17 years later, I was diagnosed as dyslexic. He said, but all I knew at the time was that I was a six-year-old kid and I wasn't doing my job. And around the middle of October, the teacher began hassling me because I wasn't be, uh, be able to read. And by the end of October, the kids were making fun of me because I couldn't read. And I realized it wasn't going to be too long before my mom and dad found out that I wasn't doing my job. He said, so I was scared. I was really scared. He said, but I was also a real resourceful kid. And I looked around the room and I noticed there was another kid in the class who couldn't read. This kid couldn't read a lick. And yet nobody made fun of him because he couldn't read. And the teacher didn't hassle him because he couldn't read because he was deaf. He wore a hearing aid. He had a hearing loss. And because he was deaf, no one expected him to read on time. He said, so I figured in my six-year-old mind, the solution to my problem was to convince everyone that I was deaf. And if I could convince everyone I was deaf, they'd stop hassling me about the reading. He said, so I went on a one-man campaign to convince everyone in my life that I couldn't hear. He said, I'd be sitting in class. The teacher would call my name. I'd just ignore her until she came over and tapped me in the shoulder. What? I'm calling. I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. He said, I trained myself not to respond to loud noises. There'd be a big loud noise outside the classroom. All the kids would run to the window. I'd stay at my desk working like I didn't hear it. We'd be out at recess. The bell would ring. All the kids would... Okay, we'd, we'd be out at recess. The bell would ring. Um, all the kids would uh, would come in from recess. I'd stay out in the jungle gym till the principal came out and said, Daniel, didn't you hear the bell? No, sir, I didn't hear the bell. He said, at home, I'd be having dinner. My mom had asked me to pass the salt, and I'd just ignore her until she tapped me in the shoulder. Dan, I asked for the salt. I, mom, I didn't hear you. My dad would call us to come in from play. I'd stay out there till he finally came out. Dan, I've been calling you for 10 minutes. Dad, I didn't hear you. He said, I even remember when my parents would grow up for an evening out. I'd be watching television, and as soon as I'd see the lights of the car coming down the driveway, I'd run over to the television set, turn up the volume as high as it would go, and be standing with my ear cocked against the speaker when they came in. He said, they took me to hearing doctors and audiologists all over Cape Cod. And they put a cup on my ear and they'd say, do you hear that beep, Dan? And I'd say, no, I don't, even though I did. And after a while, I convinced everybody I couldn't hear. He said, and everything was fine until June. I said, well, what happened in June, Dan? At this point, it was 17 years later, he began to shift in his seat and tugged at his collar a little bit and got a voice cracked a little. And he said, I'll never forget it. He said, my mom and dad sat me down. Um, the last day of school in June in the first grade and said, Dan, we're really worried about your hearing. You don't seem to be able to hear. We've taken you to hearing doctors and audiolo audiologists all over Cape Cod. Nobody can figure out what it is. So we've made an appointment for you. And you're going to go to Boston Children's Hospital next week. And you're going to stay there for four days and three nights. And they're going to do exploratory ear surgery and have your adenoid surgically removed. And this six-year-old kid went through three days of surgery rather than tell his parents what he had done. Um, 
can you imagine the trauma of a six-year-old child going through surgery that only he knows he didn't he didn't uh, he didn't need? Um, early identification would have found that kid. Early identification would have caught that kid and given him the re remedial help that he needed. I was telling that story in the Midwest, in a major city in the Midwest, and I would submit to you that's a fairly powerful story. If you care about kids, that's a story that that sort of gets you. But I was telling the story in an auditorium full of people, and about three rows back. On, on the left-hand side, there was a young man, about 25, sobbing during the entire story. Um, I mean, it's a powerful story, but it, the, the gentleman was sobbing. And it was very strange because he wasn't making any sound. He was just rocking back and forth with his head in his hands. So no one really knew what was going on except me, who could see him from the speaker's perspective, and the people sitting immediately around him. And the people sitting around him are looking at me, like, what do we do? And, then, you know, the poor guy's in great distress. As soon as we got done, he came running up to me and he said, uh, can I spend a few moments with you? And I said, yeah, are you okay? And he said, that story you told really, really threw me. He said, that story about the little boy who got the ear surgery he didn't need really threw me and brought me back to a place that I had forgotten about. And could I talk to you about it? So I said, sure. So we sat down and he said, my dad left my life when I was in the third grade. I got up one morning, I went downstairs, he was gone. He packed up his stuff and he had left abandon the family. He said, and I look back at my life now, halfway through my, my, uh, in my mid twenties, I look back at my life now and I realize that was probably the best day of my life. He was a terrible, terrible man who was terribly cruel to me and my brothers and my mom. And the fact that he left us was probably a great thing for me and uh, God helped me. But, uh, 17 years later, I don't know if he's alive or dead and I don't care. He said, I was the youngest of three brothers. And, uh, in the first grade, my dad used to beat me. And he used to beat me because he liked beating me. He didn't need a reason to beat me. He just, for no reason, we'd be sitting at the kitchen table. He'd reach across the table and slap me in the face. He was an extraordinarily cruel man and used to beat me for no reason. But when I did something wrong or made a mistake, I used to get, generally when my dad beat me, he'd beat me in the living room or the kitchen and I could just run away and go hide until he fell asleep and come back. But when I did something wrong or made a mistake, I used to get what my brothers and I called a bathroom beating. And a bathroom beating went like this. He, my father would take me, drag me into the bathroom, close the door behind us, lock the door, and then beat me until he got tired of beating me. And in a bathroom beating, you couldn't get away. You ran in the closet, he was there. You ran behind the toilet, he was there. You jumped in the shower, he was there. That was a bathroom beating when you did something wrong. He said, and in the first grade, I couldn't read. I just couldn't read. And I was so embarrassed that I couldn't read. And the way they used to teach reading in my school system when I was a kid is Mrs. Donovan, the reading specialist from the district, would come every other Thursday and she'd take all the kids in the first grade who couldn't read and bring them to the front of the class and make them read out loud in front of the other kids. And he said, and that was so embarrassing and humiliating for me that every other Thursday before Mrs. Donovan arrived, I'd go into the boys' room just before she arrived and take my reading glasses and twist them until they broke or break one of the lenses, or pop one of the lenses out. And then when Mrs. Donovan would come, I'd go up her, to her with the broken glasses and say, Mrs. Donovan, my glasses are broken, I can't read today. And I did that every other Thursday for a year with the full knowledge that when I got home, I was going to get a bathroom beating for it. When I showed my father the broken glasses that I was going to get a beating. And the saddest part of that story is I'll bet you anything, if you look at that child's file, somewhere Mrs. Donovan wrote, this kid is not motivated. I mean, you don't break your glasses every other Thursday for a year unless you're doing it on purpose. She must have known he was doing it on purpose and interpreted that the child was not motivated, which is so sad. That child was probably the most motivated child Mrs. Donovan will ever, ever have. His motivation was to avoid the humiliation. Imagine if she could have taken that motivation and injected that into his desire to learn to read. He was an extraordinarily motivated child. I mean, I own a little 1972 Common Gear. It's my pride and joy. I love that little car. It's very, very special to me. My wife bought it on our 25th wedding anniversary for a, it was manufactured the year we were married, and I love that car. But if you told me in order to keep that car, you've got to take a beating twice a month, I'd say, well, keep the car. It doesn't mean that much to me. I'm not that motivated to keep the car. This little boy was so motivated to avoid being embarrassed, he was willing to take a beating from a grown man twice a month. Um, and we need to understand the incredible impact that an inability to read has on the lifespan of a child into adulthood. Good. I'll just pause right there. Okay. I'm going to drop the camera down. This is great stuff. Okay, good. Really great stuff. I'm going to drop the in, in, in the video, um, 
we talk, it's all these adults sitting around talking about, you know, the impact of reading and comprehension and blah, 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 and all this kind of clinical, you know, good stuff. But, but our son, who now is 28, was 12 in the video. And, and what he, when we did the commentary afterwards on the film, what he says is, yeah, but what about the kid in the record store who can't pick out CD? Which, you know, that, that's what gets the kid. I mean, you know, they struggle in school, but that's only, that's only six hours of their day. No, but that's where the peer, that's where the, of school. That's where the uh, shame is the greatest. Because oh, absolutely. Because peer visibility. Yeah, yeah and that's what we're, yeah. Yeah, we're going to get it. Yeah, that, and, and basically what a kid's response to that, too. Yeah, this is, this is uh, when we talk about reading difficulties, you know, uh, I think the biggest sleeping giant in the, in the whole field is shame aversion. Yeah, yeah. Preconscious automatic shame yeah. aversion. Yeah, And we're, that's yeah. one of the things in addition to uh, uh, the uh, c code confusion. Right. Right, the code ambiguities, yeah. confusion. Yeah. And then the shame response to that confusion is a yeah. downward spiral. Right. Into and it, it, one of the things, again, Mel Levine's work that's fascinating about reputation with kids is that you can, you can, um, you, and he's got the, I can't think what the word is that he uses, but your reput your, your relationship with Tori, you can say, she's, she's a great camera person, great person, she's a kind person, da, 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 but she doesn't cook well. Okay, I mean, in other words, you, you can say she does these things really well. This is something she doesn't do well, but, but that's okay. Kids it, it can't do that. Kids look at, okay, you're, you're in my class, first grade, you can't read. You, you don't know how to read, so you're a stupid person, you're a bad person. They can't say, well, yeah, but he's great at sports. It's no, it's, it, it's you know, it, once there's one area of failure, then all of your reputation be becomes built. Yeah, and, and so visible, so visible. And you can't fake it. You just can't fake it. Did you guys, we've had people say they, uh, you know, that, that they convinced the school that they needed glasses. Yeah. And that they would just never have glasses with yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. the, the uh, mechanisms of avoiding this yeah. are... It's 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 really surprising. I think the biggest thing when we talk with uh, teachers and and what have you is the dimensions to which they do not understand this one point. Right, and right. It's huge. Yeah, that's one of our main missions. Yeah. But you know, it's it's also so much like. Um, uh, I mean, I'm a public speaker, and 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 that's what I do for a living. It's difficult for me, even as a sensitive educator, to understand how terrifying it is for other people to do public speaking. I mean, it's, you know, it's just something that, that I don't find scary at all. That's what I find enjoyable. I've gotten good at it. And, you know, you hear, you know, my brother had to give a toast at a wedding and it, I mean, I wanted to throttle him. I mean, he was acting, you know, it's time, you're going to get up and you speak for three minutes. Well, I mean, it's difficult to, when you do something well, it's very difficult to relate to people who, who find it such a difficult thing to do. And, uh, you know, try to watch a, uh, uh, physicist trying to teach his kid the times tables you know it just doesn't work because it's so natural like you said i love the analogy he's above looking down where the kid is below looking up and it's a whole different perspective yeah exactly except Um, one of the things that I, that, that I want to make sure that we spend some time talking about is the relationship between reading difficulties and learning disabilities as okay. they're generally thought of as mm -hmm. two different distinct things. I mean, there's such a cross connection between those that's not sufficiently acknowledged. I don't mm -hmm. know, did you read the part of the conversation with James Wendorf? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. walk them all the way down. Okay, well, this, this, this. Yeah. But he doesn't want to call it. Um, I mean, it seems to me that difficulties learning to read are clearly the nation's greatest learning disability. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, we're, and we're, go, we're going to do some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah let's re just speak to it, um, well, there's a tremendous discrepancy in our field and ongoing argument in the field about learning disabilities versus reading disabilities. Um, 
the bias of those of us in learning disability is that the reading, the inability to read and the reading disability is not the problem, but rather a symptom of a larger problem. That the larger problem is language development. A symptom of that is reading. Uh, the language arts consists of reading, uh, writing, listening, and speaking. And what we find is kids with learning disabilities have global problems in language that are reflected in an inability to read. However, people who say we need to focus exclusively on the reading, you have a child with poor language development. As a result of that, he has a reading problem. So you focus on the reading. Now you've got a child who can read, but who has poor language development. So the discrepancy appears to be whether you take a frontal assault on reading or whether you take a frontal assault on language. And those of us in the learning disabilities field would favor more of an assault on language because again, we see read the inability to read as a symptom. Um, literacy uh, in and of itself should not be the goal, but improvement in understanding of language should be the goal. And there's a good deal of research, body of research, that indicates that if you improve the child's ability to listen, his ability to speak, his ability to write, that reading will also improve along a parallel course. So that's an ongoing uh, dispute that, uh, frankly, is a point of uh, some concern to me because we're just working in such a multidisciplinary way now where the reading specialists won't talk to the language arts people, the language arts people won't talk to the pediatrician. What I try to do in schools where I consult is to get away from multidisciplinary programming, get away from multidisciplinary teams. The term multidisciplinary translated means many disciplines. What I recommend is what I call transdisciplinary programs, which means across disciplines, where you all sit around the table as equals, not representing your department and not representing your discipline, but rather representing the child where the problem is thrown onto the table and everybody jumps on it. Uh, in a school setting, who's to say the history teacher won't have a great idea about how to teach this kid the time tables? Who's to say that the math teacher won't have a terrific idea about how to get the kid to show up on time for his history class? So what I say is when you meet in a transdisciplinary meeting, you've got, picture, you've got 12 people sitting around the table, 12 different disciplines, 12 different undergraduate degrees, 12 or 20 different graduate degrees, 12 sets of life experiences, 12 sets of educational experiences. It's a treasure chest of information sitting around that table. And until we start talking together as equals, rather than going to these meetings and each of us giving our presentation from our own discipline, we'll continue to represent our discipline rather than represent the child. Um, uh, Rick, thank you. Relative to the oral language reading thing, I think that's really important. We've got that pretty well covered with neuroscientists that specialize in the yep. oral language development, the oral to written language continuum, like Paula Talal, and also um, the work of uh, Keith Stanovich. And uh, there's just no question that reading is a virtual reality overlay to a deeper right. oral language processing. Mm -hmm. exactly. No question yep. about that. Nonetheless, because of, for the reasons that we've been talking about relative to shame aversion, the mm -hmm. shame aversion isn't just this monstrous avoidance of a thing of thing called reading. It's also a, uh, a, a an aversion to the kind of confusion, the kind of cognitive confusion that associates with reading. Mm -hmm. I mean, children that <clears throat> children that develop an aversion to reading are developing a learning disability. In mm -hmm. the sense that they're they're avoiding learning. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's learning yeah. disabling. Yeah. 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 Massively well, learning disabling. Right. Right. So it's in that sense, rather than the saying, yes, the, I mean I understand there's a distinction that we could make neurobiologically between the three to five percent of the population that according to Wendorf and others, actually have some kind of an internal structural difficulty in uh, processing generally, general yeah. processing or language processing, which translates into various kinds of learning disabilities, no question. But we're talking 68% of our population is below proficient in reading mm -hmm. and having to various degrees feeling less than comfortable with their ability to learn. Yeah. That's massively learning disabled. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think, you know what, let me, let me do the, the stages thing and I think I'm going to get into a, into a lot of that. I think that'll work. <laughs> okay, I want to yeah. make sure we hit that Good. really Good. sharp. Okay. Good. Okay. I think the concern that I have is that most adults, caregivers, parents, and teachers don't understand the relationship that children who are disabled in the area of reading, the relationship that they have with the reading process. Uh, that's a lifelong relationship, and it's a very, very rocky marriage that they share between uh, them and the reading process. It begins in the first year of school. 
Uh, the child is a happy kid, three, four, five, six years old. He can run fast. He can jump high. He's got friends. Life is good. He can't wait to go to school like his older brothers and sisters do. He gets in the school bus and goes to school, very, very anxious and eager to begin this process. And suddenly he runs into the reading process, a code that he simply cannot break. It's his first experience with failure. He's lived in a protective, cocoonish environment with mom and dad who protect him and love him and care about him in an unconditional way. Suddenly, he's run into something he just can't do, and he has to do it. He's being told by the adults in his life he has to do it. He begins to view himself as a failure. Other kids begin to view him as a failure. The teacher and parents begin to worry if he's going to fail. And that has a generalizing effect on his self-concept. Suddenly, mom and dad report he doesn't want to go to swimming lessons anymore. He doesn't want to go horseback riding anymore. He doesn't want to go to visit grandma anymore because he's failing at this monumental task of reading. And that begins to generalize and begins to impact the self-concept. Then he moves into the elementary years. And after around second or third grade, there's an assumption we make in education, which can be very damaging to our kids. And that is that in American education, you spend the first three years learning how to read, learning to read. Then on, you're not learning to read, you're reading to learn. You're using reading as a tool. And if you haven't developed that tool by the third grade, there really isn't much hope for you ever developing because most school systems don't provide remedial reading instruction after third grade. So now the child is floundering in fourth grade. He's uh, unable to, he hasn't mastered this tool that he desperately needs in order to learn. So he begins to develop behaviors that are troubling. Um, one of the philosophies I remind teachers and parents of constantly is at any given time, at any given point in time, any kid would prefer to be viewed as a bad kid than a dumb kid. If you put a kid in a position of choosing between looking bad or looking dumb, he will choose to look bad. So you're the basketball coach, you've got your team sitting up in the bleachers uh, at the end of practice, and then you look at your watch, you realize, gee, we have five more minutes left. Uh, Kevin and Michael, come on down from the stands and demonstrate that passing drill we learned yesterday. And as Kevin comes off the stands, he slaps some other kid in the back of the head. You need to think, why did he do that? He did it because he couldn't do the drill. And he's coming off the stands and he's thinking, I don't remember that drill. I don't know how to do it. I'm going to look dumb in front of the coach. I'm look, going to look dumb in front of the other kids. But if I whack this kid, the coach will throw me out of practice and I won't have to be embarrassed. Now, the kids will think I'm bad and the coach will think I'm bad, but nobody will think I'm dumb. And I'd rather have them think I'm bad than think I'm dumb. So kids begin to develop these behaviors of avoidance where they purposely get into trouble to avoid being in class, where they want to develop the reputation of being a bad kid because it's so much less painful than developing the reputation of being a dumb kid. And um, uh, we need to understand as the child goes into middle school, I was asked by a newspaper one time, what's the most profound understanding that parents and teachers can have about kids? And my response was this, what we need to understand is that kids go to school for a living. That's their job. They do it six hours a day. And if they are failing at their job, they can't do the majority of what they're asked to do. They don't really like or care about the people they go to, they work with, their, their colleagues, their classmates. They're not understood by the people they work for, their teachers and supervisors. That's a pretty lousy existence for a child. Imagine how you would feel if you had a job eight hours a day where you couldn't do most of what you were asked to do. You didn't have the basic tools you needed to do your job and nobody around you understood. You'd be pretty unhappy as well. Kids go to school for a living. And not only do they go to school for a living, they're more closely identified with what they do for a living than we are with what we do for a living. Uh, my brother came to visit us recently, and uh, I should know better. I opened up the back door of the car to greet them when they pulled up in front of the house. I reached in and shook my nephew's hand and said, hey, Tim, how are you? How's school? First question I asked him, how's school? I was with my brother for the entire weekend. It wasn't until the end of the weekend when we were leaving that I said, oh, by the way, Chip, uh, how's work? I don't identify my brother with what he does for a living, but I identify my nephew with what he does for a living. When you see a child in the street from your neighborhood you haven't seen in a while, the first thing you say to him is, hi, Billy, how's school? It's their entire identity. And around middle school, things really begin to fall apart because, again, there's no longer remedial education offered. The child can't use the tool of reading, and so school becomes even, even more and more confusing for him. Um, the other thing that happens around elementary and middle school is teachers begin to make assumptions. They assume the child can read. 
They assume that, you know, take this list of instructions. It's it, So many times they'll hear a teacher say, the kid will say, I don't know how to do this worksheet. And the teacher will say, well, it's written right there. Yeah, I, yeah, but I don't know how to do it. Well, it's written right there. There are the directions. Yeah, I've read them, but I don't know how to do it. And the teacher will say, it says circle the right answer. And the kid says, okay, I've got it. In other words, once I heard it, I was fine, but I wasn't able to understand it from a reading point of view. So then you get into the middle school years, which, and again, the inability to read begins to, to manifest itself in either the child becoming withdrawn or the child acting out. Then you move into high school. High school, people are talking about college, people are talking about you're getting massive amounts of reading. Now, instead of just reading a chapter of a book, you're assigned to read an entire book. And, they, and many of our kids really hit the wall with the reading process at that time. The problem that we have in our middle schools and high schools is no one is doing any remediation for kids who, have, who struggle with reading. When you have a child who's failing in school, there are two approaches you can take. One is remedial, the other is compensatory. And this is how it works. You've got a child who's in the seventh grade, but he's functioning at the fourth grade level. He's reading at the fourth grade level. You have a gap there. He's in the seventh grade, reading at the fourth grade level. You've got a gap and you wanna close that gap. There are basically two ways you can close it. One is re with remediation. Remediation says, kid, you're in the seventh grade, but you're functioning at the fourth grade level. I'm going to close that gap, and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to make you a better reader. I'm going to give you remedial instruction. I'm going to take your fourth grade reading skills and bring them up to seventh grade level. I'm going to close that gap by improving your reading skills and bringing them up to grade level. That's remediation, and that is good. The other approach is compensation. Compensation says, kid, you're in the seventh grade but you're reading at the fourth grade level, and I'm gonna close that gap, and here's how I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna to try to make you a better reader. I'm gonna take, take the seventh grade material and bring it down to your level. I'm gonna put the book on tape. I'm gonna modify the material. I'm gonna modify the assessment. I'm not gonna to try to bridge that gap, gap by improving your skills. I'm gonna bridge that gap by bringing the material down to your level. That's compensation, and that's good too. But what troubles me is, as I go around the country, I see that so many schools are so deep into compensation that no one's remediating anymore. And I'll go to a middle school and I'll say to the principal, how are things going with the children with reading problems in this school? How are things going? And the principal says, we're doing great. In fact, we took all of the history books last semester. We took all of the history books and we put them on tape. So now the child with a reading difficulty, instead of coming and taking out the reading the, re the history book, he can take out the history tape. We're done. We're fine here. And what that principal is forgetting is this. The problem is not that the child can't read the history book. The problem is the child can't read. And, and by, deal by putting the book on tape, you haven't dealt with the problem. You've only dealt with the symptom of the problem. It's like if you had a terrible toothache and I kept giving you pain medication. Well, okay, that's going to take care of the symptom, but until somebody gets in and deals with the abscessed tooth, you're going to continue to have problems. And this compensation, compensation, compensation that goes on, where instead of trying to remediate the child's problems, we merely compensate for it. As a result of that, in almost every state in the United States now, there are lawsuits being filed against school systems who are being sued by students who have graduated in the top 20% of their high school graduating class reading at the second or third level because no one ever remediated the problem. All we did was compensate for it and compensate for it. There's also a failure right here to recognize that, that the process of learning to read is, is more fundamentally engendering of uh, the health of learning and the ability to learn about whatever somebody might need later than any of these other particular subjects. Yeah, exactly. There's it, a whole misorientation yeah, as to yeah. what's most fundamental here. Yeah, the, yeah the, well, there was a, a major campaign a few years ago called "Reading is Fundamental," and 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 in one simple sentence that that, that grabbed the issue that that reading is the basis for it. And of course, what happens with adolescents is because they don't enjoy reading and they don't read well, and it's such a struggle. They don't, not only don't they read well, they don't read much. They choose not to read. And so then, is because they're not practicing the reading process, they never get any better, and it just becomes cyclical. Uh, it's, no mis it's no small mistake, or it's not by chance that 53% uh, uh, of the children in the United States go on to four-year colleges, where only 13% of children with learning disabilities go on to four-year colleges. So high school is a nightmare for the person who struggles with reading. But what many people forget is the adult, the adult who is unable to read. 
uh, the government keeps playing with the definition of literacy, but the, generally you say a person is illiterate if they can't if they uh, re can't read to at least the eighth grade level. But you need to read it at a higher level than that to read Time, to read Newsweek, to read the New York Times. Um, it's been estimated that Medicare forms you need to be reading at 14th grade level. You need to be reading at, at the rate and the uh, the comprehension level of a person who's at uh, uh, halfway through college in order to understand the Medicare forms that the government. Is, is currently cranking out. So not only does the inability to read impact on the adult's ability to work and to function and to maintain a, a, a respectable job, but I'll never forget a, a, a gentleman coming up to me who was in his early 40s, and he was virtually a non-reader and was involved in in tutoring and remediation to be able to learn how to read. And we had quite a conversation and I said to him, what made you, after being a non-reader for 30, 35 years, what made you go out and take the incredibly courageous step to take reading lessons to, to try to become literate? And it was, it was extraordinarily touching. He said, he, has a, he said, I have a daughter who I adore. She's absolutely the light of my life. And the greatest moments I had with her when she was growing up were reading her stories at night. But she didn't know that I couldn't read. So I just opened the book and I described the picture using the clues, the context clues of the picture. And I would basically tell her a story in the storybook. And she had no idea I couldn't read. By the time she got into first and second grade and she began to develop reading skills, she caught on to my trick. And she'd look at me and she'd say, no, daddy, read, read the words in the story. That's not what you're saying, isn't what, read the words, daddy, read the words. He said, and I was extraordinarily humiliated in front of my daughter that I couldn't read. He said, and what I found myself doing was I would purposely in the evening, purposely find a reason to punish her. And the punishment was, I'm not going to read you a story tonight. In order to avoid that interaction and the embarrassment, I'd come in and I'd say, the television's up too loud, Ellen, you're not going to get a story tonight. And I did this time and time again until eventually she stopped asking me to read her stories at night. He said, and one night I just realized what a terrible thing that was to do, that I was actually tripping my daughter up to find an excuse to punish her so I wouldn't have to go through the humiliation of reading. He said, and it was that day that I realized I needed to go get help. And he's doing quite well, thank you very much, that adult literacy, there, there is uh, real promise in the approaches we're using in adult literacy. It's never too late. And this man realized now that, uh, that reading is a great pleasure for him. Good. That was a great, really nice piece. Okay, in our remaining time, I'd like to drill into some of these questions. Yeah. Then, yeah? Um, in particular, I mean, I, 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 I like all the stories. We're going to be going through the, the nature of the way this is going to get edited. We're probably going to, you know, the longest clip we'd ever use is a minute to two sure. minutes, yeah. right? So we're going to be slicing through and taking jewels and overlaying right. and saying, uh, we'll call some of these Lavoie stories. Yeah, right? yeah, you know sure. yeah, right. And to, to, to take the, some of the cream out of that, and I really appreciate that. Um, and as we kind of come to a, to a close here, I'd, I'd like to invite you to, um, you know, make any kind of summarizing uh, dark like statements that you'd like to make mm -hmm. and, uh, and invite you to uh, go into this um, uh, question that I asked earlier about the, the relationship between learning disabilities in the mm -hmm. field and reading and reading as a learning disabling process right. for those that don't get it right. to the extent that it just it's mind numbing to me when I look at this and we're going to talk to somebody at Harvard later today yeah but the various things children are at risk for yeah. that they might that they might develop that could do harm to their lives mm -hmm. or could diminish their their potential in life yeah the risk of having some reading related difficulty that can harm their life is greater than everything else we pay attention to combined yeah, absolutely well you know uh uh, Reed Lyon talks all the time about the the number of states in the United States who use uh, reading skill levels in third grade to project how many prisons they're going to need 20 years down the line. I mean, that's horrifying to think of that, but they really do. They Their prison building programs are based on the literacy rates in their third grades, and they figure in 20 years they're going to need this many prisons based on the number of kids who can't read in third grade. I mean, that's how close the correlation is. That's, that's how, that's how, when we how talk real the correlation that, is. When we talk about the literacy to yeah. what we're basically saying, this comes back to the shame avoidance. Yeah. The kind of things that you've been talking about, and what, what we're saying is that children that struggle with learning to read 
become self-disabled in some way. Yeah. Their relationship with themselves becomes disabled. They become more prone to, to social pathology. Yeah. And, and it radiates, you know, at massive expense to our society as a whole and to our population as a whole to yeah. such an extent that, I mean, this is, this is the nation's greatest learning disability. Yeah. I want you to really yeah. speak okay. to that as okay. strongly as you can. There, there are a number of schools within the field of education in terms of the way we view the relationship between reading and learning. I come from the school, again, where reading, inability to read, is a symptom of a larger language problem. The overwhelming majority of kids who have difficulty, who have learning problems, have difficulty reading. And the overwhelming majority of kids with reading problems also have learning problems. So I have a difficult time teasing the two of them away because they're so fundamental and so interlocked. The reading process is the first experience of failure that, that our children meet when they get to school. And what begins to happen is, um, as they become isolated from the other kids, they become rejected by parents and teachers, they can fall victim to all sort of, of societal pathologies. We see a disproportionate number of kids with reading and language problems. We see a disproportionate number of kids in populations of kids with eating disorders, um, uh, juvenile delinquency. Uh, there's an attorney in, uh, there's a judge in the state of, um, Connecticut, who is so convinced of the link between reading and language problems and delinquency that she actually, when she meets a child in juvenile court, she will say to the attorney, to the prosecutor, does this child have a reading and language problem? If the prosecutor says yes, then the judge meets, uh, conducts the proceedings in her chambers. If the judge, if the uh, prosecutor says no, she conducts the hearing as she normally would. And if the prosecutor says, I don't know, she says, find out and adjourns the hearing until the, until the uh, prosecutor finds out because we're finding that with kids with reading and, learn, and learn, learning problems, for example, juvenile delinquency is a strike one, strike two, strike three situation for our kids. They're more likely to get involved in juvenile crime because they can't hold and get jobs because of their reading and language problems, so they need the money. So they're more likely to get involved in juvenile crime. They're more likely to get caught because they're not real good at being bad. They don't plan real well because of the learning and language problems. So they're more likely to get caught and they're more likely to get stiffer sentences from the judicial system because they don't handle the proceedings really well. So it really is a strike one, strike two, strike three. You see a disproportionate number of LD kids and kids with reading and language problems and populations of kids who abuse drugs, who abuse alcohol, self-abusive behavior, suicide, a startling statistic that in, um, Los Angeles County, California, approximately 9 or 10 percent of the kids in Los Angeles County have severe diagnosed learning and language reading problems. However, between the years 1995 and the year 2000, of the school-age children in Los Angeles County who attempted suicide and were successful, almost 60 percent had a history of learning and reading and language problems. Now, that, that statistically is almost mind-numbing. Uh, you know, do the math. It's, it's easily uh, seven, eight times what it should be. So the failure, the inability to read because of a language, whether it's directly or, or indirectly caused by a learning and language problem, becomes, looms very, very large in the lives of these kids. They're unable to, it impacts their peer relationships, it impact, impacts their relationships with teachers, and it impacts their relationship to learn. The reading and the learning are so intricately tied together. It's such a Gordian knot at this point that attempts to untie them and separate them um, into the learning disabilities camp and the reading disabilities camp I see as an exercise in futility. They're so closely linked and so closely tied together. Here's some differences and distinctions that I would like to exercise. I appreciate yeah. where you're coming yeah. from. I mean, for example, you just made a 10% quote, 9 to 10% mm -hmm. quote in LA County. Well, that's true. The, the, on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, uh, nationwide, 88% of, uh, of black fourth grade children are below proficiency in reading. Right. 88%. Right. Eight times that number are at some degree of life risk here. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. What do I, but what I said was, and I always make a point to say it, 10% have diagnosed, you know, the, I hear you, yeah, I hear exactly. You. But yeah. what, what we're basically saying is, is that some are so severe, right? It's right. so obvious um, that we can put a hand, we can put a label on them in this way, yeah. but nonetheless, some six to eight times that okay. number on you the know, national average yeah. are struggling and yeah. they're not getting the same degree of attention yeah. as these. You know, I, I know I got something to be good for it. Good. Let, me, let me, okay. One of the problems that I see as I see school systems across the country is that school systems have adopted a triage approach 
in terms of dealing with children with reading and language problems. Triage, you probably recognize from MASH and medical shows, triage is a widely accepted and extraordinarily effective technique that's used in medical emergencies. Uh, a bus rolls over, there are 40 people in different stages of injury. The first people who arrive, the emergency workers who arrive, they know their job is triage, which is basically to put all of the victims in three categories. Category A are people who are going to live anyway. They've got minor injuries, but they don't need immediate medical attention. They're, they're going to be fine whether or not they get immediate medical attention. Group B are the people who are going to die anyway. They've got burns over 80% of their body. They have mortal injuries. They will not survive even if they get immediate medical attention. And group C are people who need immediate medical attention in order to survive. And the workers go and tag each one of the people to put them in category A, B, or C. Then when the emergency teams arrive, the conventional wisdom is that 80% of the time, energy, and resources go to group C the people who need immediate medical attention to survive. So 80% of the doctors and nurses and personnel go to work on group C, no matter how large that group is. It could be the smallest of the groups, but those people need immediate attention in order to survive. 10% go to give first aid to the people with minor injuries. 10% of the doctors and nurses and personnel go to comfort the dying. And 80% go over there to group C. I would submit to you that's a very practical and a very usable technique in medical emergencies. It was invented in 1915 during World War I and it's still being used. However, that triage has moved into public education where I'll go to meetings and I'll hear teachers say, why should we give this kid help? He's going to make it anyway. He's a bright kid. His father owns a construction company. He can go to work for his dad. Uh, you know, he, let's not give him any help. He's going to make it anyway. And this kid here, he's not going to make it anyway comes from a rough neighborhood, bad family. I've had his family, his brothers and sisters. He's not going to make it anyway. Let's not invest any time and energy in him. Let's take all of our time and energy and invest it in these kids over here who are identified and we can work with. I would submit to you that's against the federal law. Federal law says free public and appropriate education for all kids. And what we're doing is using this triage to eliminate kids who we think, in our wisdom, are going to make it without help, or the kids who won't make it no matter what we do, and we're focusing on this identified group over there. And as a result, there are literally hundreds of thousands, millions of kids who need remedial help in reading in order to master the reading process, in order to prevent this downward spiral into, into social pathology, um, and yet they're not receiving it because they're not identified and they don't fit into this group C. Good. All right, how much have we got left? Uh, 14 minutes. Okay. Um, let me talk about uh, the language processing. I mean, I appreciate mm -hmm. the fact that you don't want to make, uh, uh, you want to be careful with the distinctions here. Yeah. I really do. When we talk about um, learning to speak, with the exception of, um, you know, a very, very small percent of the population, you know, estimated between one and three per four percent. Yeah. Um, learning to speak is so built in, is so right. genetically You're pushed hardwired and driven, yeah. so hardwired yeah. for it, that as Terence Deacon, the author of The Symbolic Species, yeah. a cognitive scientist, anthropologist, said, we can come in with half a brain and we're going to learn to speak. Right. 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 Learning to read is a recent artificial, more exactly. specifically, it's a artificially confusing learning challenge. Mm -hmm. It is not like learning language. Right. It's a different thing altogether. Absolutely, yeah. Now, in learning, to, learning language, what we need is to be verbally in dialogue, interacting with a uh, language-rich environment yeah. in order to develop the, the brain capability to yeah. be more extensively language able. Right. 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 That's all we need. Yeah. We do not need anybody giving us any intentional instruction. It's not an artificial to our nature process. It's wired in. Yeah. All we need is adults or caregivers around us who are addressing us, who are talking to us, who are using rich vocabulary, complexly, richly, so that it pulls our brain into making those differentiations and distinctions so we become more language empowered. Yeah. Yeah. When we hit the wall, there's no question that without developing to a certain threshold level of competency at that level, when we hit the wall of this confusing challenge of learning to read, we're under-empowered to take off in it. Right. 
right? Yeah. And so you could divide the reading problem as fundamentally, number one, that. Yeah. Second stage is this thing is artificially confusing, just in general and in particular with respect to the um, the English writing system. Right. In fact, in conversations with neuroscience like Merzenich and others, it's really clear that just as in the learning to do the uh, phonological processing associated with um, learning to speak, hmm? yeah. that, that any fuzziness in the distinctions the brain has learned to pick up in making phonemic distinctions in the oral language soundscape will result in a, a poor language processing. Yeah. Right? Right. Well, equally true, any fuzziness in the correspondence between letters and sounds represents right. an additional brain processing lag time that can result in a difficulty. Right. Uh, equally true, how we feel about these things not only generates this aversion that you've been talking about in your stories, but it fundamentally cognitively um, dissipates the processing bandwidth necessary for right. reading. Right. So the moment that I become self-conscious, my brain's so busy with that, I don't have the power to read. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So all these things are working against one another, yeah. working together, right? Yeah. But the first part, you could say, this is these are nat we have natural, we have learning disabilities that affect our natural ability to learn. And these other things are artificial. Right. Right. Right? And yet they become learning disabling. Mm -hmm. They become fundamentally learning disabling because the individual child feels like develops an aversion. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. That's learning. That's as learning disabling as as being born with something wrong with my right. brain. Yeah. See, the, the, one of the big problems that that you're going to run into, and I'm sure you already have with this, is so much of it. So much of the of the. Uh, the shootout at the gunfight at OK Corral here is is um, is over government money. I mean, there's only so big a pie, and everybody wants a piece of it. And and one of the things that concerns people in the field of learning disabilities is that the, particularly under the current administration, which we can all pray and hope um, goes the other way uh, soon. But but there's there's such an incredible emphasis on reading at the ex, at reading as being the problem. And, and absolutely, yeah, and, I'm not tracking yeah, that. No, I, well, I, I am I, trying to say this is a continuum that we got to understand an entirely different level of richness and granularity than right. we've been thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. It. Okay. Yeah. No, let me, let okay. Me, yeah. Okay. Okay. One of the great gifts that's been given to the field of reading and, and education through people like Reed Lyon is the understanding that reading is an extraordinarily unnatural process. Uh, oral language is far more natural. It, it, it develops by modeling, and yet it also, uh, a, a little four-year-old would say, uh, uh, the, the, the preschool teacher brought in a bunny today and I holded it. Well, the child has never heard the word hold it, um, but he's taken the word hold and made it past tense because he knows he puts ed at the end of a word. It means it happened before. And there's all this wonderful language going on that comes part from modeling and part from the natural, instinctive kind of intrinsic uh, desire and ability to form language. It's a fascinating process to watch. Reading is a totally different process. It's totally unnatural. It's artificial. It's imposed on the human being. Uh, we were not, you know, it's, it's only been the, the last number of generations that even had a written language to deal with. And the English language, of course, can continually throw its curveballs at all of us with the inconsistency and in the spelling and the uh, arrangement of words. Um, so it, it just exacerbates the puzzle for our kids. Uh, they also need to understand how to read at different rates. Uh, you talk very naturally at different rates. If you're in a hurry, you talk faster. If you're trying to explain something, you talk slower. And, and there's a parallel in the reading process where you, if you're looking for a number in the telephone book, you just scan and skim down the page. You don't have to read every name. You just keep scanning and stopping your eyes occasionally, whole different set of eye movements. But again, it's a very, very unnatural process, even though it has parallels to the oral language process. We need to understand there are always going to be kids for whom reading is the problem. There will also be a cadre of kids for whom reading is a symptom of a larger problem. We need to make sure, particularly the second group, has an enriched language environment where oral language listening and speaking is emphasized in order to build up the foundation for the reading. In the second group of kids, reading is the foundation for the language problem and more reading is going to improve the language. In the first set of kids with learning disabilities, you need to improve the language in order to improve the reading. Um, but where that shouldn't be 
a point of contention in the field. It should just be a point of understanding that for some kids reading is the problem, for other kids reading is a symptom, and there needs to be treatment for those two different kinds of kids. A one-size-fits-all frontal attack just on the reading process without doing any sort of language enrichment is not going to reach the number of kids that we want to reach, particularly the kids with severe language and learning problems. Excellent. Good. I'm, I think we're done. Okay. That was excellent. All right, great. Well, and yet again, what I said, David, is what I bring to the table is, uh, you know, the uh, uh, not the science of it. But, oh, no, um, I understand and appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. What I wanted, what, this was an exercise for both of us. Yeah. What I'm really interested in, as I've been trying to, uh, to indicate, is, I mean, our society doesn't get this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, to talk with uh, Louisa Motes or the other people that we've talked to, it's really clear that one thing we could kind of all agree to, no matter what, our otherwise different lens here is that our society as a whole doesn't get it. No, no. Those of us that can read and read well to the point that it's become transparent, yeah, can't really understand or empathize yeah. with the the difficulty and the effect of the difficulty of it not being yeah. transparent. Yeah. And yet, a hundred million people in our society are to various degrees having their lives diminished by this. Yeah. This is a result of an artificial process, not a natural one. Yeah. It's an artificially confusing technological mess yep. that our children feel as if there's something wrong with them because they're not doing it well. Right, right. I mean, we got to get that differently yeah, as yeah. a society. Well, see, one of the challenges, too, that you face with kids with, with uh, learning disabilities that you don't face with kids with, with, with just reading disabilities is a thing called performance and consistency, which is that it's very, very common for one of our kids, a kid with a learning problem, to master material and know it cold on Wednesday and not know the same material on Thursday. And so they begin to develop the, particularly the brighter ones, begin to develop the understanding that school is basically a crapshoot for them. It's a game of chance. They have good days and bad days that are beyond their control. So they begin to recognize, as the kid said to me one time, it just was so profound. He said, you know, I know if I, I've got a test on Friday, if I'm going to have a good day on Friday, if all my planets are in their right orbit and I'm going to have a good day on Friday, I'm going to pass that test whether or not I study. And if I'm going to have a bad day on Friday, I'm going to flunk that test whether or not I study. So why should I study? So exactly. There's no I, correlation. I can, I can get yeah. that. I There's get that. And here's no where, correlation. Here's where I'm with that one. On the one hand, I feel like incredible compassion for those children that have those kind of difficulties, mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, it seems to me for reasons con connected to the way the government's uh, uh, distinctions work and how money gets allocated and what's considered a learning disability and what's not considered right. a learning disability, that something in the neighborhood of eight times that number oh. of children are having their lives mangled, yeah. but that are not getting the same kind of attention yeah. because they don't fit into this box. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's, that's where the triage thing is, you know, that, that comes in, is basically we're focusing on that group of kids. And I think, you know, frankly, those of us in LD, what we're afraid of is now this new emphasis on reading, which is great, is going to begin to diminish the what it's taken us 40 years to get is for people to understand that reading can be a symptom of a problem understood, not the problem understood. Itself. but you're, what you're saying is reading can be a, for for some percent reading can be a symptom of this deeper problem Ar ar arguably, and I think this is the, a great case, of the 60 to 80 percent of people that are having uh, reading difficulties at the level that they are improficient, right, right, right. Um, uh, probably 60 percent of them, the ground problem is language facility, yeah. Right, yeah. even yeah. though they're not necessarily learning disabled. Mm -hmm. right. Right? right. So I think that we're right on here, and I'm saying because we're trying to def defend focus. Yeah. On this smaller group, right. which I have great compassion for, right. we're, we're um, like like Wendorf was doing. Yeah. We're kind of turning away from these others because, right. well, they don't have the same kind of problem. Right. Even though the effect of the problem on their life is is monstrous. Right. Yeah. I'm seeing more and more, and I'm very encouraged by this. In fact, I was down in in Florida a couple of weeks ago, and I did a conference that was jointly sponsored by the Learning Disability Association in the area and the Literacy Council in the area, which is great to see those those coming together because we've been kind of spitting over the fence at each other for years, you know, because we're so afraid they're going to take some of ours and they're, they're so, and we, we realize we have far more in common than we do different. The, yeah. pla the place that you have in common and the place that, 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 that actually is the ground of the work that we do is stewarding the health of our children's learning. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. If, if we come yeah. from that perspective, we say, look, the, what's most important, yeah. how healthfully we learn. Yeah. yeah. 
Right. Well, you know, one of the things that, uh, of course, I, I'm out there fighting the inclusion battle all the time. And uh, um, one of the things that I, I say to one of the great misconceptions is teachers believe that if you accept kids with learning problems into the school, um, it lowers the standards of the school and the school becomes Dilutes less quality. Yeah, exactly. The teacher yeah. And therefore others are suffering. My argument is quite the opposite. It makes teachers more creative. It makes them more, more responsive. It makes the kids more tolerant. And I, I, I tell the old New England story of this group of kids in front of an elementary school waiting to get in the beginning of the day, eight o'clock in the morning, they're standing in the parking lot waiting to get into school. And, um, there'd been a surprise snowstorm. So the, the custodian is out there shoveling off the steps so the kids can get in. And this little boy in a wheelchair says, will you shovel off the ramp so I can get in? And the, uh, the custodian said, well, you know, wait a second, I got to shovel off the wall, the steps for these kids. When I get done, I shovel off the ramp, which I have to wait. And the little kid says, but if you shovel off the ramp, we can all get in. You know, if you make this place accessible to me as a person with special needs, you've made it accessible to everybody. And, and that's something that's being lost that we're learning. You know, see, my bias is we're going to learn more about language by studying learning disabled kids than, than anything because they don't get it. I mean, so we've learned more about language since we, since we discovered learning disabilities in terms of how language develops because, you know, the best way to study disease is to study sick people. And the best way to study how language develops is to study people who don't develop language well. And what we're finding is so many of the techniques that we use for kids with language disabilities and learning disabilities work beautifully for the other 60% that you're talking about. And so to say that we're two separate fields it's ludicrous it's we've got good practices that that work and and the the remedial reading world has good practices and we need to share the ideas rather than this this ongoing gun battle between right us. right yeah. right i mean and i know it's separate from the methodological things and implementation levels i'm talking when we're talking about uh consciousness yeah. in the country to the dimension of the problem yeah um we're just way off. See, the problem, the problem you ran into with Jim, and you're going to run into, and I know Jim real well, he's a good friend, but, and you're going to run into with any of the folks um, in the learning disabilities field, is that we are constantly accused of over-identification. You know, a mother said to me, oh, what we used to call boys will be boys, we now call attention deficit disorder. You know, that we're, we're over-identifying. So now, all of a sudden, the government is saying, is taking the definition of normal language and learning and, ex and and making it smaller and smaller. They're contracting in order to keep a smaller footprint and yeah. more defensive. Yeah, and so what we're saying is, no, 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 we, we don't want to play we don't want to play that game because we're already being accused of identifying. We start talking about numbers like 80% and we're, it's going to totally discredit our field. Yeah. So yes. that, oh, I'm, we're I, wrong. I'm saying I know we're wrong, but, <laughs> but it's that it's that. And you get somebody like Jim, who's you know, who's, back whose right life to the edge is in and that. He, yeah. No question, he yeah. could not take the question. Yeah, yeah. It, it just basically there. But I think it's important to understand why they feel I that do. way. I do. I do understand that, yeah, and, because, I, and I respect that. In a yeah. way. And, and I don't know if you read the postscript. I mean, I, I can understand and appreciate.